All right, let's get started. I think people are starting to filter in later and later as the semester goes on. It's not that long yet, but we'll do our best to stay starting on time. I guess you always have the video. You can always watch those two seconds of the beginning of class if you miss it. So today, we are going to finish up the MATLAB review we started last time. That should not take very long. I, uh, I think I, get, I showed, did a show of hands here. Pretty much everyone has experience with MATLAB already, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, it's pretty basic MATLAB, so I'm not going to... You'll really learn a lot of this stuff when we actually do it on the homework. So with the new parts of MATLAB, <coughs> you'll learn then. Then I'm going to take a little bit of a digression and talk about a slightly more general case of optimization problems. As I talked about when we talked about least squares and linear regression, linear regression can be formulated as an optimization problem. Uh, and that's how we formulated it. It's we formulate a lot of ways, but we're going to talk about it in terms of optimization problems. But there's actually much more general classes of optimization than just least squares. Right? So there are ones that you can't, for example, get an analytical solution for, where you have to solve it using, using some computer program. Um, and so I'll very, very briefly introduce the type of optimization we're, we're going to encounter in this class. Um, and then as we go, we'll actually talk about uh, how you solve those problems. So then I'm going to talk about alternative loss functions. So remember, we use this squared loss to capture the difference between the desired, uh, or rather the true output and the predicted output. We use the difference there squared. But there's no reason to really use squared loss over anything else, right? There's a lot of things you could use. So I'll talk about some other ones we can use and how these lead to different optimization problems that require different te techniques to solve them. Uh, and then finally, because I think gr these graphs tend to kind of make it look simpler than it is when we talk about linear regression. People always think about lines because I always show graphs in 2D because you can easily view 2D in a set of slides. Um, but it's important to know that linear regression and all these methods are not restricted to one dimensional inputs. In fact, very important they can be generalized with, not even generalized, they, the exact same method uh, I derived for general dimensional inputs. So they can be as high dimensional input as you want. And so I'll visualize that a little bit in three dimensions at least. Um, and hopefully you can then extrapolate to higher dimensions than that. And if we finish all this in time, uh, we can even get onto some of the nonlinear optimization, which is, in the next, which is in the next set of notes. So first of all, were there any questions from last time? Uh, we think we sort of were going pretty quickly through all this. But hopefully, um, hopefully people know this stuff already. So it's pretty straightforward. Any questions? OK, let's just get delve right into more MATLAB then. All right, so I think when we ended, we had talked about uh, some, some special matrices like the ones matrix. Uh, that's the ones, for example, matrix of all ones. Um, there are other ones, but then if you want to, one function that you've actually seen a lot is the size function. That just tells you the size of an array. Oops, I didn't define A as being that. That's a hard part of not being able to actually see what I'm writing here. Should probably just mirror the screen instead of doing this, but I'll still do it because uh, I have the actual script here on my other screen. So now, if we do size of a, uh, that will give us how big a is. And if you want just the first dimension there, you can say size a one or size a two. That'll give you the size of a. And those you'll use a lot because oftentimes you iterate over all the elements of an array and things like that. I'll use array and matrix interchangeably here. Just want to talk about MATLAB. Uh, in general, those are different things, but, but I'll, I'll use them uh, to mean the same thing in, in MATLAB. If you want to know what variables there are defined, you can write who s. Whose is just gives you a little bit more descriptions. It says how big it is, what kind of variable it is, etc. Um, and if you want to then remove that variable, you can type clear a, and now a is no longer a variable. Um, all right, moving right along. Indexing into functions. So uh, let's say I have a vector x, 5, 1. So oops, x is a random vector, 5, 1. And I want to just talk about the third element. I just say x3. If I want to talk about the third to the fifth element, I do x3 to 5. Um, there's also a nice little keyword end there that will always go to the end of the thing. So that's just the, the 3 to the end index in MATLAB. Um, you can do the same thing for matrices. Uh, one comment is that, uh, so I'll just, I ran, ran three, two. So if you type A like this and only put one index, it'll treat A as a column vector and it'll take the indices treating A as a column vector. So for example, A1 to 2 would just be these two elements here. 
And I guess it actually also treats it as a, as a row vector, though, sometimes. I don't know why it does that. Um, all right. One thing that people don't often deal with that much in MATLAB that we will deal with in this course is complex numbers. So MATLAB actually can handle complex numbers just like any other number. Uh, the number i, or the variable i, is predefined to be the imaginary unit. By the way, so is j. Uh, engineers use j, and mathematicians use i, so it just defines both of them. And it's going to be a little tricky. Uh, one, one mistake you might make is that if you use i or j to, in, in a for loop, for example, it will no longer be defined as the imaginary unit then. So you want to clear that thing in a for loop, or just make sure that you use only one or the other, not both of them. We have to do the same thing in notation, by the way, when we write stuff out on the board. Uh, we typically don't want to sum over j if j is the imaginary unit. So we can define matrices that are imaginary. So 1 plus 2 times i, uh, 2 plus 3 times i, 4 plus, I guess I kind of <coughs> missed my units there, and that was 6, uh, 6 plus 7 times i, something like that. So this is a, an imaginary matrix now. And just one important point to make, and by the way, it was, you do the same thing if I typed J there. One important point is that A, what people normally call transpose, is actually the complex conjugate. So this will also conjugate all these variables, take the negative of the imaginary part. If you just want transpose, uh, you have to just do this. That will dot tick just transposes them. And then conj just takes the conjugate. So it doesn't transpose it, but it just takes the conjugate. Which would be the same, I guess, as conjugate transpose and then transpose again, but we'll just do conj like that. That's all we need to know. Uh, it, you will sort of have to encounter those, so be careful when you use complex numbers not to do things like define an i in a for loop and then do that kind of stuff. Um, there's a bunch of built-in functions, all the ones you expect, right? There's, you know, log, uh, exp, sine, all those things are going to be built in. Importantly, uh, if you say for most of these, if A is a matrix, man, I'm not so good at typing blind there. If A is a matrix and you type sine of A, this will actually do element-wise sine. Same goes for things like exp. Exp of A takes the element-wise exponential of each element in A. That's very different. There's also something called the matrix exponential, which is a different thing than this. Matrix exponential only applies to square functions. So if you do have a square matrix like this, though, you can take the matrix exponential of that. That's xm of this thing. But that's going to be different from x of it. We won't worry about what that is. What, what's actually, what it actually does in, in one, one simple definition is that you actually take the eigenvalue decomposition, exponentiate the eigenvalues, and then form that back with the exponentiated exponenti exponenti eigenvalues instead of the eigenvalues. But we won't actually worry about what this is really doing here. One, some handy commands are format long and format short. So format long makes, gives you a lot more detail. Uh, format short is the default. Let's see, blazing ray long because everyone already knows this stuff, I imagine. Plotting. So plotting, uh, everyone knows how to do basic plotting, I presume. But one this thing in that, so let me actually define x here to be a sequence that goes from 0 in increments of 0 0.01 to 2 times pi. And then I can plot x and then sine of x. And that will give me a plot of this thing. So let me bring that over here and make it big. OK, so that's a plot of a nice sine wave. All right. Um, there's all, you can also do three-dimensional plots in a couple ways. So plot three will, plot three. Plot three will draw a 3D line. So it's important that plot 3 is not for drawing surfaces, it's for drawing lines in 3D. So you can give it the x and the y coordinate and then the z coordinate of that line, uh, but it's going to draw a line in 3D. So let me try to come up with one here. So if I plot x, sine of x, and then cosine of x, oh, come on. It likes to give you help sometimes, I guess, too, which gets in the way frequently. Okay. All right, so here's that graph of sort of a parametric plot in, in 3D. So this is you know, a sine wave from one angle, and then uh, going to be a circle from another angle, and going to be a, co a cosine from another angle, I believe. No, there we go. This is this angle. So you can mess around with that kind of stuff, but it, draws, it just draws plots, lines in 3D. If you do want a 
surface or something like this. You need to use a little bit more fancy commands uh, because a surface has to be defined right by x and y for each point of that surface and the corresponding z value. You can do this actually automatically in a lot of ways, but one thing we can do is uh, use a command called mesh grid, which you might see sometimes. So again, often if, if, if you sort of don't know how to do any of these things, or these things sound, sound confusing, just, uh, just do the help for all of them. But if we also make y similarly uh, 0.1, actually let me just do it by not that big increments as before, otherwise it'll be really hard to read. So let me do this. Oops, I did that kind of funky. Let me just do this. Okay, so x and y are now vectors. Um, and uh, they both go from 0 to 2 pi. And if you want to plot, say, a surface that's the sine of x plus the, plus the cosine of y or something like this, um, you're going to want to first type x and y equals mesh grid x, y. You don't have this actually surface. Some plots can design automatically, but this is what it's doing internally. That creates a matrix that sort of corresponds to every single value of x. Uh, in a big matrix that sort of repeats it over and over, and every single element of y in a matrix that repeats the, in the other dimension. So these give you in total every corresponding element of x and y. And then you can do things like, say, z equals the cosine of x plus sine of y. Oops, sine of y. And the command to generate surfaces, for example, is surf. And so that will give you a nice looking surface there that's doing all those things. Right. By the way, uh, for surf, actually, this little one would also work with little x and y here, but that's kind of a special command that doesn't always work, so you'll sometimes want to use the mesh grid call. All right. Um, program control. MATLAB has a little standard things that you're used to here. It has things like for loops, so for i equals 1 to 10, display um, to string i. I actually have a more complex example in the, in the notes here, but it's not really worth talking about that. For loops, it has if statements, it has while loops, all the kind of things you would expect. Um, to define a function in MATLAB is the last thing I'm going to talk about, but you can edit a new file, so I'm going to edit um, Make a function called square and double. All right, and that's on my screen there. So now, and I'm going to just define this function as y function y equals square and double x. And I guess it depends which way you do it. It's a different function, but I'll just say y equals 2 times. By the way, that would be in uh, times. By order of operations, the square would actually be evaluated first anyway, but just to make it a little clearer, I'll put the parentheses in there. Um, one thing that you might come across in MATLAB is that MATLAB will not do operations in an intelligent order, and this particularly is the case of matrix multiplications. I mentioned during the first class, or one of the first classes, that the order of matrix multiplies can actually make a big difference in terms of the efficiency of the operations, right? Because you might be forming a scalar first and multiplying it by a vector versus forming a big matrix first, stuff like this. MATLAB will not do it intelligently. It will just do it in order. So if you want to make the order correct and more efficient, you have to do that yourself with parentheses. But this is a function now that uh, squares something and doubles it, so we can, of course, call something like square and double a 4 square. Oops, I did something wrong there. What did I do? And I was going to say that. Okay. All the things you already know how to do, I'm sure, so I won't bother talking about this anymore. But we will use MATLAB a lot, and we'll actually use some things you haven't seen before. In particular, we'll use this optimization library called YALMIP. Uh, YALMIP is really nice. I'll talk about why it's really nice today. There's some other ones, too. Another one's called CVX that people can use, but uh, most of the code and the homework will be in YALMIP, so it's a little easier if you just use that. Uh, but there's MATLAB, basically, MATLAB lets you do a lot of these things that would normally take kind of a lot of infrastructure code and a lot of kind of trouble to go through all this 
you know, trouble setting up matrices and setting up optimization problems, all this kind of stuff, it can, it can do it really, really easily. And that's why we use MATLAB, and that's why, uh, despite some of its issues, we, we still tend to use it a lot. Uh, I should say that machine learning people in CS always use MATLAB, and people in statistics always use R. I don't really know why, but it's just how it's developed, and, and we're like this forever. It's actually kind of better their way, because R is free, and MATLAB, or MATLAB is not, and the, the free replacement of MATLAB, which is called Octave, is, is great, and it's getting much, much better, but it still can't quite do everything that MATLAB does. Uh, and so actually, for this class, it's tough to use Octave. You can do it, but in particular, YALMIP and these optimization libraries are, are hard to get to work in Octave. So. You can do it, but it will require a little bit of hacking if you want to do that. All right, let's uh, quit this because I think it isn't. Probably uh, we're not going to learn anything you knew about MATLAB that you didn't already know. So let's get back to our discussion of linear regression. And in particular, let's talk about fancier things you can do in terms of different optimization problems. All right, so last time we got through uh, loss functions. We defined loss functions, went to this nice big derivation of the gradient, and we derived the solution, the analytic solution, for the optimal set of parameters for least squares regression. Uh, and I showed you how to write this in MATLAB too. You load files in, you make them the proper size, and you set up this theta equals inverse of phi transpose times phi times phi transpose times y. But actually that, that call is so common that there's a special command in MATLAB for it, which is the backslash operator. So really, linear regression with the squared loss function is, is literally one character in MATLAB code. So kind of nice, right? It could be a lot more in C, for example. But now I want to step back a little bit and talk about general optimization problems. So we talked about linear regression as an optimization problem, right? Remember, our optimization problem was we wanted to minimize over theta this function j of theta which was equal to, in our case, the sum from i equals 1 to m of squared loss in this case. So it was um, theta transpose phi xi minus y i squared. Right, and we wanted to find the minimum value of theta of, we wanted to find the, the theta value that minimized this function here. This is an example of what we're going to call an optimization problem, which we'll, recover a, which we'll encounter a lot in this course. And it's really quite a simple example because there's no, no other constraints on theta. Theta can be any value whatsoever. Uh, it just has to minimize this thing. But in general, we're going to encounter problems that are of the following form. We want to minimize it before. We want to minimize some j of theta. So we want to minimize some cost function. This is a function of theta. Subject to some additional constraints, though. We don't want to let theta take on any value. For example, we could have a bunch of other functions, gi of theta, being less than or equal to 0. So maybe we want, for example, I don't know why we'd want this here, but maybe we want theta 1 plus theta 2 to be less than or equal to 5. Um, and just for sort of notational simplicity, we usually write less than or equal to 0 here. And so you would rewrite this, for example, as saying minus 5 less than or equal to 0. You also might want some things to be equal to 0. Another way, another thing you could do there, by the way, is require, for example, all these things to be positive. So if we had some background knowledge that somehow informed us that theta had to be positive, that negative solutions of theta did not make sense, um, it could turn out that, you know, from the particular idiosyncrasies of the data, you know, maybe it wants to make one theta slightly negative and one really much more positive. That actually would not be a very good solution for us because we have sort of background knowledge that, make, that says theta has to be zero, or it has to be greater than zero. So maybe we want to constrain theta one greater than equal to zero, uh, and theta two also be greater than equal to zero here, for example. Um, I'm assuming there's two elements of theta here, but there can be as many elements as you want. This, of course, is the same kind of thing. You just, the, the constraint would then be negative theta is less than or equal to zero. Okay, so you can add all these sorts of things. You can also add equality constraints. Um, things like 
theta 1 plus theta 2 equals 5. I don't know why you want to do that. Maybe you have a budget of 5 units for your thetas and you just want them to somehow add up to this. It's not very realistic in the least square setting, by the way, but we'll encounter a lot of problems, especially when we do power flow analysis that says, you know, things like, well, the generator can't produce more than 5 gigawatts of power. Sorry, I think that would be a big generator. Say 5 megawatts of power. And you'd want to actually add that constraint to your optimization problem because if it gave you a solution where some generator produces more than 5 megawatts of power, that would not be physically realizable. So it wouldn't really give you, help you out if you got a solution that had some huge amount of power by one, from one generator. So these are going to come up a lot in this class and it's really sort of important to think about this general framework for how we approach optimization problems. Now there are many different classes of optimization problems and I'm writing a sort of a very general form here. You may have heard of things like linear programming or quadratic programming or even semi-definite programming or things like integer programming where actually some of those constraints are the constraint that elements of theta have to belong to the integers for example or they have to be zero or one value. They can't have anything in between. We will encounter that a little bit maybe but most of this course is really going to talk about a very specific type of optimization problem which we're going to call, well, which is called a convex optimization problem. And this touches us actually on, on the question someone asked outside of class last time. And I'll introduce it this way actually. I'll say that, remember, I said that we wanted to find a minimum value of theta, right? We have some function theta. And we want to find its minimum value by finding the place where the derivative, this is in one dimensions, where the derivative was equal to zero. Right, that's what I sort of said, and that's how I plugged in our solution to least squares, that's how we got our solution. I just set the derivative to be equal to zero, or in this case, the gradient for a multivariate optimization problem. Um, but someone sort of correctly asked, well, is that really enough? Because couldn't, this, this is also a point where it equals zero, right? This point would also be equal to zero. Shouldn't you do things like look at the second derivative to figure out if you're at a local optima, a, a, a local maximum or a local minimum, for example? That's absolutely true in the general case. The fact, though, is that we're going to mainly deal with problems that are called convex. And I'll define convexity this way. A convex function is a function where you can take any two points, theta and theta prime. So this here, this, this dimension here is theta. This is f of theta. So I'll take any two points, this one and this one. And a convex function says, if you draw the line between these two, that line will lie entirely above that function. Uh, that might seem like a simple sort of thing, but it's actually a very, very powerful concept, convexity. Because you'll notice that if I have this other function, where things could kind of be, kind of be weird here, this is no longer true, obviously. Because you can draw a line here, and this line is below the function. Now what this corresponds to, another way of defining it, uh, for at least for one dimensional functions, uh, the, the, the person asked about whether this was, you, you know, you, you want to look at the second derivative, for example, to test whether it's second derivative is positive, then it's at a local minimum, if it's negative, it's at a local maximum, things like that. For convex functions, it's pretty easy to show. So if it, if it obeys this property here, that property that the average of any two points so this line here is always above that function. If it obeys that property, the second derivative is always greater than or equal to zero. So actually, we don't even need to check to see whether it's greater than or equal to zero because it's greater than or equal to zero everywhere. So if we find a point where the gradient is zero, we know it is a local optima. And the nice thing about convex functions also, which is pretty easy to show, is that for a convex function, all the local optima are also global optima. There can be more than one. You can have a function like this. This is a function that's still convex. Uh, and there are lots of local optima there. Basically any point along this, I'm trying to draw a point where this is all the same here. This is all zero, say. Any point along here is a local optima. Local optimum, sorry. <laughs> uh, but they are also all global optimum. If optima if the function is convex. That's actually very easy to show right from this definition. You basically show that if this holds, then uh, a small move, a if this holds, if you have two local optima and this property holds, then 
that, that are not global optima, and then you can create a contradiction because the point in between them should actually be lower than either of those two points, or at least equal to it. Right. So if you have this condition, then you take two points. If these were, say, both local optima, uh, let me draw like this. So these are both local optima, right? Then because the line between them has to lie below, so the function has to lie below this line, then every point on that line has to also be an optima. So that's sort of the, the basic idea of the proof. I won't do it in detail. Uh, there actually are some notes, that, again, that I posted online on complex optimization that go through that proof in some detail. I think those are on. Actually, does anyone check? Are those ones online? I think they are, but okay, they are. Yeah, good. So they, that, that sort of has a rigorous proof of this, but it's, it's, it's very straightforward. Now, the, just briefly speaking, because we're not really going to deal with positive definiteness and things like this, um, but the equivalent condition, remember, the, sort of the, the, the fact that the second derivative is always positive, that's really a thing for one dimensional, you know, it functions to take one dimensional inputs, right? Because things that are bigger than that, there isn't a single second derivative. We have to remember last time we found that Hessian matrix, which is the matrix of all possible derivatives. The equivalent statement for convex functions in multiple variables is that the Hessian is what's called positive definite. That just means that all the eigenvalues are bigger than zero. We won't worry about why that's the case, but if you've seen that before, that's sort of the equivalent statement here um, to the second derivative always being positive. So we have the exact same thing as we had before, that all global opti sorry, all local optima are also global optima. And I guess what it means kind of for this class, though, forget about all that what I just said, because that's kind of the math part of things, right? What it means for this class is that we can solve these problems very, very quickly and pretty easily with some very powerful off-the-shelf libraries. So essentially, and you'll see this in a second, if we have a problem that we know is convex, there's, there's just a lot of very powerful tools that will let us find the solution to that problem very quickly. Again, quickly being kind of relative. Uh, in, in the, the correct statement is that there exist polynomial time algorithms for this. I guess we're all CS. This is a CS class, so I can, I can say that. But, but um, what it means in practice is that for reasonable size, I mean polynomials can still be pretty big, right? For reasonable size problems, we can actually find solutions very quickly uh, and you can just type these into MATLAB and you'll find solutions. So we'll see this in a second. Um, but what we're actually going to do is first take a little detour to different possible loss functions that happen to also be convex in our case. And we'll talk about, first of all, how you used to have to solve these things before maybe five or ten years ago. Um, with the advent of Fairness libraries, let you solve these very efficiently. And then we'll talk about how you can solve them now. And I think you'll, everyone will agree that solving them the current way is much, much easier. So, actually, before I, before I do that, let me, let me talk about solving optimization problems first. I meant to have this slide up. I guess I forgot I had this slide in there. I meant to have this slide during my last discussion now. We will, in this class, as I say, use an optimization library called Yalmuth. Uh, it stands for Yet Another Linear Matrix Inequality Parser. Don't worry about what that all means. But uh, it's actually, I guess it was already yet another one when it was invented, but, and it's quite a bit old, <laughs> quite a few years old now. But it's quite nice. Uh, and another one people use a lot is called CVX. These are both pretty nice. This one is a little bit more flexible in that it can do things like uh, integer programming problems as well and other types of problems. And you can pass variables you create with these things a little bit better, a little bit more easily. CVX is more like kind of a, a prototyping language in and of itself. And so we're going to use Yalmup here. But let me first show some quick code for how you would solve the least squares problem in Yalmup. Remember, our least squares problem was, uh, I had it, written, had it written before, it's minimize this function j of theta, which after some munging into the proper form is equal to this R matrix phi uh, theta minus y, two norm squared. And the nice thing about Yalmup is you can write this problem almost exactly like this. Remember, to solve it ourselves, we had to sort of expand this out, take the gradient analytically, set that equal to zero, and solve the thing. Uh, instead, we're going to just say, solve this thing here. In fact, you could, you, you could write it as a norm here. Really, this is just a sum of all the elements squared. So I'm going to take phi times theta minus y. That's the inside here. I'm going to square all the elements there, and I'm going to take their sum. That's exactly kind of the problem that we set up, right? That's exactly the natural form of what we had, what we had solved. And so 
don't worry about kind of the boilerplate code. This line here, theta equals SDP var, that just defines theta as an optimization variable. Uh, SDP is a semi-definite program, but this was sort of meant originally for solving semi-definite programs, but now just don't worry about that. Uh, it's just sort of the name you use in the ELMIP. And then you say solve SDP, and again, it's not actually an SDP here, but people still use that, that terminology, or the functions rather, rather still use that terminology. This first thing here is actually the set of constraints. And in our problem right now, it's empty. There are no constraints, so that's, that's fine. Just pass the empty matrix. And then you, the second term here is the objective function. And that, in this case, is just this thing kind of expressed in a very natural form. This goes ahead and solves it. You, you compute the solution, returns theta. Theta is actually still one of these kind of custom variables. So to get the actual numeric value of theta, you call double theta. Double here, it's kind of confusing because there are two values. People thought it meant like get the two values of theta. It's not what it means. Double it just means double precision. So it just computes the double precision value of this, the floating point value of theta. So however big theta is, just type double theta. That'll give you actual numerical result. Otherwise, theta is some weird uh, variable that's sort of a, of a type that's specific to, to Yalmuth. So that's great. We can solve least squares like this. And if you solve it like this, it'll take you know, on the order of maybe a thousand times more than if we write phi black slash y, right? And so you might think, well, that's not really that great. Um, if you knew how to solve it in one character, now I'm solving it in a whole bunch of characters there. Which is true. Uh, you wouldn't want to solve these squares necessarily with Yalmip. It's sort of a, not a very good use for it. But what we'll see in a second is that you can make very small changes here, which completely change the optimization problem. You can set them up very naturally in this setting here. And um, that lets you solve these things, these other alternative programs very easily, whereas setting those up in an analytic or even a standard form that you can pass to kind of a normal, older optimization solver is very tricky. So I'm going to go through that right now and sort of, uh, sort of detail some of that. But first, are there any questions about this? Who here has used one of these before, either Yalmip or CVX or something, by a show of hands? Well, some people have, so uh, that's actually good if you haven't used it before. They're very, very easy to use, so, so don't, don't worry. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about alternative loss functions. So remember, we started out defining these loss functions as some measure of the difference between y and y hat. And one of the ones we picked for kind of arbitrary seeming reasons is we say, okay, we're going to use a squared loss function. We're going to take y minus y hat and square that. That's a reasonable, right? I mean, if they're close together, that's very small. If they're far apart, it's big. So it's a reasonable loss function. It doesn't, frankly, there's no real reason for using it other than the fact that it happens to lead to very nice solutions. That's not quite true. You can actually justify this in terms of a probabilistic model with Gaussian likelihoods, but, but don't worry about that. From a pure kind of functional standpoint, or optimization standpoint, it's just another loss function. It's just a way of measuring differences between y and y hat. So we could pick that. That seems reasonable. But we could pick other ones as well. So why not we pick just the absolute value of the difference between them? Right? We could do that. Why don't we take, maybe we say we don't care if um, we're within one unit, I guess in our case this is going to be gigawatts, but we're, we don't care if, our, if we have error within one gigawatt of our true power, our true demand for that data. Remember the running example was predicting peak demand from temperature. So maybe we don't care if we're with, as long as we're in one gigawatt. Right? We want to say we have zero loss then. We can use something like, like the deadband loss. And the deadband loss is formally defined as the max of this absolute value here minus epsilon. So that would give you like this. Um, this function here, this would be this thing minus epsilon, uh, and this thing here would be epsilon, negative epsilon. Um, but we don't want our loss functions to be negative. Remember that was a condition of loss functions, that they're always positive, uh, just by definition in some sense. Um, this would give you the same solution, of course, as this one, because it's just this thing shifted down a little bit by a constant amount. So we don't want our losses to be negative, so we're going to make it the max of this thing and zero. And that's what I call a dead band loss function. 
And epsilon you can also pick to be kind of whatever units you care about for your problem. If you don't care with being within 0.1 gigawatts, you could be 0.1, etc. You could also make a dead band loss with the squared loss function, by the way, too, or you could combine the squared loss and the, and the absolute loss in interesting ways. But I won't talk about all the possibilities there. There's a lot of possibilities. But hopefully what, you're, what you can see is that there really are a lot of things you can do right, to, uh, to come up with different optimization or to come up with different notions of this loss here. Okay. So now let's take the absolute loss here without this little epsilon. Let's take the absolute loss. I'll just write this by itself. y minus y hat, the absolute value of that. Now, let's write our optimization problem like we did before. In this case, we want to minimize over theta j of theta, which is now equal to the absolute value, or rather the sum, i equals 1 to m of the absolute value of theta transpose phi xi minus y i. Okay? Now the question is, how do you optimize that? Well, unlike before, the tricky thing is this is actually not differentiable, this function. Right? The absolute loss looks like this, and it has no derivative there. It has something called a subgradient or a subderivative, sub subdifferential, but we're not going to get to that level in this class. Uh, and for our purposes, it's just, it's just not, di not differentiable, right? The, the derivative is not continuous, so it's not differentiable at zero. And you might say, okay, well, you know, that's just one point. Uh, what's it really going to matter? But it, it really actually matters a lot because uh, the absolute loss and what, what will tend to happen is that you actually get several solutions that are several elements of this thing will be right at that point or sort of, maybe I'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, essentially it actually encourages solutions to take on exactly the zero value here because you sort of suffer very high loss, very close to zero, as opposed to something like this where the loss kind of gets very, very small for the squared loss, for example. Um, but this fact that it's not differentiable is actually a, a big deal here. We can't take the gradient like we did before and set it equal to zero. That will not have an analytical solution. So the way you solve this, and this is kind of the way you used to have to solve it, you used to have to go through this with every optimization problem and figure out how to do this, is you convert it to a optimization problem with constraints. Okay, so you take your unconstrained problem and you convert it to one that has constraints. Now, I'm going to, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to introduce a new variable, okay? I'm going to use a new variable. I'm going to call it new i. It's going to be a real valued number. Well, it should be positive, but just say it's real value for now. These are scalars. Uh, and there's going to be m of these. So really, new is a vector in Rm. And I'm intuitively, what I'm going to do is I'm going to require that this thing the absolute value of that thing be less than or equal to nu. Okay, so I'm going to require that beta transpose phi xi minus yi is less than or equal to nu i. And now I'm going to minimize the sum of the nu i's. One to m, new i. Now, what's important to see here is that these two things together are equivalent to this. This is a little bit more. Well, actually, forget this for now. That's how you actually do this. But um, these two things are equivalent to this. Now, that's not obvious at first, right? Because you're saying, well, okay, if this was equal to that, that would be true. And obviously, I'm just defining this as being equal to that. I'm minimizing the sum of these things. That's fine. Uh, 
But the point is that this is actually also equivalent even when it's just less than that. And the reason is that we're trying to minimize the sum of these things. This also, by the way, has to always be positive because this thing's always going to be positive here. So if this is ever negative, this couldn't be less than it. So these things have to be positive. And if we're minimizing the sum of these things, if this was true, if that was ever strictly greater than this thing, well, we wouldn't be doing a very good job of this then, right? We're not really doing a very good job of minimizing it if this is strictly greater than that ever. So what it turns out is that in minimizing this thing, when you minimize it, you will always get solutions that will make this equal to that. So we, we don't write it initially as being equal to that, because that actually is, is sort of a, actually a hard constraint in some sense. You can sort of think about this as, actually, let me, let me not define that. But basically, this would not be uh, a constraint we could normally express in an optimization problem. It would not be a convex constraint, is, is the formal definition there. But don't worry about that. The, the, sort of the, the thing that I, that I want to sort of say it's just if we define it like this, and we are optimizing this by minimizing the, the sum of the news here, then we actually get a solution then where this is always equal. So the solution here then would actually be equal to the solution here, the minimum solution here. Of course, it turns out that we want to, you know, this, this constraint here is, is kind of it's okay, but it still isn't quite in the form where most typical solvers can, can solve that. And what we do in addition to that is actually modify this slightly and just say, okay, well, if this thing inside is positive, then this implies the absolute value of that is less than that, obviously. So we're taking care of one direction there. And if we also add this constraint, this is neg less than negative nu i, that actually together is equivalent to the fact that it's greater than the absolute value of this thing. Does that, does that make sense to everyone, this little transformation here about why you need the new eyes on both sides? This is the same thing as saying um, that the absolute value of this thing, oops, absolute value of theta transpose v x i, oops, x i less than y, of the new, new i. Those two are the same. But optimization packages, at least most of them, actually require it to be in a form like this. So I won't, so I, I sort of kind of been writing a lot of things in this in, in, as a jumble here to kind of write it point by point. But what you get in the end, if you kind of munge every, put everything together here that I've written down, is you can transform that problem up there, just to minimize over theta of this big thing to this problem here. Minimize over theta and nu. It's important that theta is still a variable here, right? Because if theta was fixed, then we would just pick this to be the absolute value of that, and we couldn't really do much. Remember, we're trying to find the theta that minimizes this whole thing. So the way that we actually do this is we introduce these new variables here. These are also called slack variables, by the way, if anyone's ever heard that term before. And we introduce these variables new, minimize the sum of the news. That at our solution, remember, is the same as the sum of the absolute values there. Subject to this constraint, which is effectively the constraint that nu i is greater than the absolute value of this thing. So this now is an optimization problem that has a constraint, but which is equivalent to our original problem up there. Are there any questions about that transformation? Okay. So now, What's nice about this problem is this is a, a problem called a linear program. What that means is that this has linear constraints. The constraint here is linear in all the opposition variables, which is theta and nu. And the objective is also a linear function of, of the opposition variables, which in this case, are, again, are just theta and the nu. Of course, if you tried again back in the day, before maybe five years ago, just to plug this into an optimiz optimization library, you couldn't do it. Uh, and the reason why is that if you ever encounter linear programming before, what you might have seen is they typically want programs to be in what's called a standard form. So you can't, this, this is a problem that is a linear program. 
Okay, this, is, this is a linear program, has linear objective, linear constraints. Um, linear programs are always convex, by the way. Um, linear functions are convex functions. They're sort of a simple example because they're always on a line. So the line actually is always on that function. But linear programs are convex programs. This is a linear program, but it's not the kind that you can typically solve. Typically, to solve a linear program, you need to put it in a, what's called a standard form. And one of those would be the following. When minimize over z of c transpose z subject to, without all of subject to because subject to the following constraints that some matrix A times Z is less than or equal to B. For some definition of C, A, and, and B. And by the way, if you can formulate your program in this, func in, in this form, then this MATLAB call, linprog C, A, B, that will give you the optimal solution. So if you can put it in a form like this, you can solve it easily, is, is, is the, the lowdown here. But our program wasn't in that form, right? I'll come back to this page in a second, but our program wasn't in that form. It was in this form. So the final step, first we have to remember convert to a linear program at all by removing those absolute values, by, by introducing slack variables. Next, we have to convert this program to one which is in standard form. So maybe I'll just write this down, and I'll write my other optimization prog uh, problem before. So minimize over theta nu, the sum from i equals 1 to m of nu i, subject 2. Uh, these constraints, negative nu i is less than or equal to theta transpose phi x i minus y i, which is less than or equal to nu i. Okay, I want to somehow convert this into this form. So let's do this bit by bit here. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is remember, talked about special matrices. You know, I, I don't I actually say that this has to hold for all i equals 1 to m. So this is one of those things I was talking about before, of taking things like this and putting them into matrix form, something you're going to talk a lot, we're going to do a lot in this, in this course. But I'll just <coughs> sort of go, go do a few things. Remember, we sort of at first didn't like the use of those sums that kind of are cumbersome, so we're going to just use uh, the all ones vector and say so one transpose nu. Uh, we've eliminated a sum now. We can just treat this as a vector of all the nu's. Similarly, we can actually turn this thing into a set of vector constraints. Right? So this is a, you know, a scalar value. This is a scalar value and we have to have a lot of these things. It's a little bit simpler if we can transform this into a constraint. This is itself a vector constraint. I should also add, by the way, um, this thing here is a matrix. This is a vector. So this is saying when, when you have an inequality in terms of vectors, that means that every vector on the left is less than or equal to every vector on the right. So we can write this thing as sort of a vector inequality instead. The way we do that, and I'm going to go a little fast here because we did a similar thing with least squares, um, but it's the exact same procedure. We can make a vector that has that, yeah? For the, for the last thing, is it element-wise or like, when you say It means element-wise, yeah. So, so, if, if, so if, you know, one, two, three, this would be less than or equal to two, one, uh, sorry, <laughs> two, three, four, right? It would not be less than or equal to two, one, four. Um, and basically what, what this means is that when you say subject to this, it means that all these constraints have to hold. So it, it means element-wise, really. Uh, it's, yeah, it's not some sort of you add them up and is that less, you know, is the sum less than that or anything like that. It just means every element here is less than the corresponding element of everything there. So they have to be the same size. A times Z has to be the same size as B. And with these definitions, it should be hopefully pretty apparent they are in fact the same size. 
So I'm going to turn this into a, a matrix inequality. So does anyone remember, in least squares, we came up with a, with a vector that had every single element of this thing in it. Does anyone remember what that vector was? You can just yell it out. So you can make every element here. You can basically make a big vector that has every element here, right? Theta transpose phi x1 minus y1 all the way down to theta transpose phi xm minus ym. Well, not, I guess, depends how you define a, but, but in our own notation, remember how to do this? I think someone does. You can just yell it out. Right. Does everyone remember that? The way we defined phi, big phi, vector of all these things times theta minus y. That was a vector of every element here. So this inequality, another way of writing it, for all of them would be to say that big phi times theta minus y, that's the vector of all the corresponding elements there. That has to be less than or equal to nu, which is the course vector of all the nu's, right? Which is also, by the way, less than or equal to negative nu. Okay, so now I've written this, I'm getting closer. <laughs> I've written this like this now, which is, you know, an objective that is in vector form and constraint, which there's only, I guess there's two constraints because one's less than this and then there's less than negative that, but they're both in vector form. So now, finally, I'm going to transform it to standard form. And I'm going to do that by defining, and, and they're there if, if, if you want to sort of have the reference. But basically, if you make the variable z actually consist of all your variables, so first comes theta and then comes nu, that way, right? um, then the objective term, this c, would be, the, well, there's no theta in here, so the term that multiplies theta in the objective is just zero. The term that multiplies nu is the ones. Um, now remember, the nice thing about this is that zero and one were these magical quantities that we don't have to write their size because their size has to be implied by the actual function we're talking about here. So we know that one has to be what dimension? What well, dimension is nu? Yeah, m by one. So one here is also m by one. And the zero is how big? N by one. It's a vector. It's a vector of zero in R n. Um, okay, so now let's do a. And a is one of the tricky one of the tricky parts here. So first, let's look at this thing. Okay. Just this side of it, because we can't have sort of less than and greater than in the same constraint. We have to make one for the less than and one for the greater than. Um, so how do we write this thing as a function? So this whole thing as a function of this z variable. What do we multiply by it? Less than or equal to. Uh, I mean, what's what's there and what's here? What are the different terms we need to multiply it by to make this one hold? So theta multiplies by what here? It's just phi, right? So the first element is phi. The second element, what multiplied by nu there? Remember, I'm bringing all the terms onto the left side here. So what, what goes here? What was it? Okay, so this is the problem. This, this, this is the mistake I said everyone would make. Um, and it's not, right? Because 1, negative 1, tra uh, or transpose, or just times nu, um, this is an n by 1 vector, and this is a m by 1 vector. I guess it could be any size. Maybe it's m by 1, but it's not going to matter. Uh, and that outputs a or even if you do a transpose, that would be, it would be the correct size, but it would output a scalar. Um, importantly, what times nu equals negative nu? What goes here? 
Because right, we want negative nu, really, on, on this side of the equation. So what times negative nu equals, what times nu equals negative nu? It's not negative one, yeah. Negative one. Right, so, so be very careful about that. This is the problem that, that a lot of people make. Um, it's the negative identity there that multi multiply by, by nu. And it's less than or equal to, well, the, the thing on that side is just y. Okay? So now I've written this first constraint as, as that. Do the same thing for the other side, and what you'll find is that we have to multiply out. Let's see, so we need to move this to the other side, so we're going to actually have negative phi there. Um, we're going to have negative nu still, so it's still negative i. And then on the other side, you actually have negative y. So, um, where was I writing all these things? Okay, so, um, does this make sense to everyone here? I've, I've written it down now, but basically, if a is equal to this thing, so a is equal to phi, negative i, negative phi, negative i, and b is equal to, well, actually, I hope that you could see that on the board. You may not be able to, so, oh well. Um, and b is equal to y, and negative y, that should be what I have there, right? Um, in this case, I'm going to erase all these because maybe I shouldn't erase that. Anyway, in this case, <laughs> with these definitions of z, c, a, and b, this problem here is equivalent to our absolute loss minimization problem. All right, so that, that's probably on the harder side of what we'll see in this course. I mean, we'll see a lot more kind of applied stuff that is more power system Z that's equally kind of tough. But this is sort of a, this is a pretty tough trans transformation to make, right? And you can imagine this was not, if you didn't know, if I didn't sort of walk through all these or you'd never seen it before, um, it'd be pretty tough to come up with this all from scratch, right? And sort of come up with a linear program that was equivalent to optimizing this problem that we actually care about. So, quite a bit of effort. Um, and you have to use, to use, this is sort of how you used to do this, by the way, uh, I think even 10 years ago, right? If you want to solve this problem, yeah? Uh, so today's, uh, LP solvers, do they still pass what you give into this problem? Yeah, sometimes LP solvers can have a little bit more specialization. So like the linprog function in MATLAB, as I, well, I run H there. Uh, Linprog and MATLAB, um, as I said, the first few things are C. You first pass it C, and the A matrix and the B matrix. You can pass a few more things too. So you actually can also pass um, the next thing if you want to pass it is a A EQ, which is a set of equality constraints and B EQ. So you can also just add equality constraints A equals B EQ. Um, you can have that. You can also have uh, upper bounds and lower bounds. So um, Z lower and Z upper. Um, and that adds the constraint that ZL is less than or equal to Z, which is less than or equal to um, ZU. And it turns out that internally they actually are encoding these a little bit differently than these ones, but not that differently. They're actually pretty similar. Um, equality constraints are actually usually held, uh, handled a little bit differently. They're not as if you add two inequalities that combine to the equality. Um, they're handled a little bit differently for sort of technical reasons, how they actually solve those things. But more or less, they use this exact form. I mean, more or less, they have, and, and the reason is that if you have things in a standard form like that, you can write very efficient code to solve just that one case, right? It'd be hard to write code where you could, I mean, that's what I'm going to talk about in a second, but it's harder to write code, you can imagine, that can take kind of any general description of a linear program and immediately come up with efficient ways of, of solving that thing, right? Whereas if you have kind of a standard form like this, you can actually do it in a pretty, a pretty you, know, you can develop a pretty efficient algorithms that can do that. So, as I said, um, here's how you solve it, and here's how you used to have to solve it. So, first of all, you, you do all that math that we just did. Um, you work out what the, what the LP is. Um, and you type in, you know, you define C, C is zeros and ones, then phi, negative i, negative phi, negative i. Um, and you call this linprog with just these ones here because we don't have any equality constraints or, or bounds. And then it returns Z. But Z has actually both, of course, the thetas and the nus in it. 
And so if you want just the thetas, you then take the first one to n elements from it. And you get a solution. And this is, this, this is the solution for that data that I had before, showing you the, the um, predicting demand from high temperature. That's the theta you get from that. So, OK. Uh, that's kind of a lot of work. You can imagine if I do this yourself, it would be not that easy to do. Here now is the YALMIP code to do the same thing. And what's nice is that it's actually just one line of, I mean, five characters different from the other one. Remember before we just took the sum of this thing squared. Now we use the exact same code as before, but instead of a square we just put the absolute value there. So we type this into MATLAB, and what comes out is the exact same answer. And this is useful for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I work with a lot of complex optimization, and I will always still, to this day, if I have a problem that I'm trying to write a, a solver like that for, or trying to munge it into form, you know, the, the matrix form, um, I'll make mistakes sometimes. I'll leave out one of these negative signs. If you leave out one of the negative signs, that's not the right solution anymore. It will not give you the same solution. So what I will do, always, is first write it in YALMIP, very quickly for a small problem maybe, because it's very easy to write. Uh, this takes me, you know, however long it takes me to type out that, that code in MATLAB, which is not very long. And then, if I want this eventually, it, sometimes this is fine. Sometimes if I'm just doing you know, one little quick test, this is, this is plenty. I don't need to do anything more. So I've saved myself a lot of time. Uh, sometimes if I want to go back and, you know, as I said, just like least squares, you know, the backslash is maybe a thousand times faster than, than YALMIP. Uh, you don't have maybe a factor of a thousand, but maybe, you know, a hundred, probably, probably a thousand still. Probably the, the least squares is maybe ten thousand times faster. This is probably a difference of a thousand or so on that order. This one's a thousand times faster than that. At least with a good linear programming solver and for the right, you know, for a reasonably sized problem. Um, so if I want a really fast solver, I have to solve a lot of these problems. I will eventually convert it to that form. I just, you have to do this. Um, but I'll start off doing this. And in this class, in fact, I think we're going to mainly just stick with this. Some of the 884 solutions or, or questions, we'll do this a little bit. And you'll actually have some experience converting to the, to the LP form. But for the most part, what we're going to do here is we're going to stay in this form because it's much easier and kind of conceptually, that's all you really need to know. Um, we'll, some of the more advanced problems will actually ask you to develop a faster solver using that, those transformations. But for the most part, we'll stick with these guys here. So are there any questions about this whole procedure? There's, I, I went through a lot here. Uh, so go over it again if, to the notes. You'll have to do a similar one, by the way, in the homework. You'll do the same exact thing for this um, dead band loss. So that's a go through. It's not that different, but it's a little bit different. And seeing where it's different actually is not is not trivial. So you'll go through it all. You'll you'll kind of munch through it, and then instead you could just type you know this thing exactly into YALMIP, and that should solve it immediately. So you can verify your work pretty easily, by the way, also. Um, but we'll go through it one time just to kind of you know turn the crank a little bit. So is there any, are there any questions here? Yeah. Uh, when does the homework come out? Yeah, the homework's going to be out next Tuesday, probably. Uh, I wanted to cover a little bit of the nonlinear regression, because there's, there's, that's on that. So I, so I wanted to give a little bit of time bef uh, and, and do the reviews before the homework comes out. But it, it should be out next Tuesday. Chances, and there might be chances actually to do, do the next time, but I wanted to cover, kind of finish up linear reg nonlinear regression, rather, before, before giving you the homework. So there'll be plenty. There's, there's only four assignments, so it's, it's a pretty regular schedule. There won't be a problem. Um, Okay, so now, now the question is, um, what, you know, I've, I've defined all these things, right? I've defined all these loss functions. We have squared loss, we have absolute loss, dead band loss, you can come up with many, many more. Which one do you want to use? This is kind of a, a philosophical question, almost, right? Not quite, but which loss would you want? Why would you want to use squared loss versus absolute loss? They're both measures of distance of how far away your prediction is from the true value. But why would you want to use one and not the other? Um, and there are reasons, by the way, to use one, not the other. I'll give, I'll, I'll describe, and this, this is not actually, we're not going to evaluate any of this, but I'll, I'll sort of intuitively give you one reason why you might want to use one rather than the other. 
Um, but then I'll show you that sort of depressing weight often doesn't make a much of a difference <laughs> which one you use. So say you have uh, some data like this, and you want to fit a line to it, and you have one point like this. Okay, so you have one thing, maybe it was an error or something like that, there was some outlier, maybe it's a real point, it's just that you, know, you probably aren't going to get a function that looks exactly, you know, fits all the slides. So, so you can't with a line, right? So if you use squared loss, the difference here, the error here, this is pretty big, and squared loss make that big squared. <laughs> that makes any sense, right? So it's really big. And so your line will probably actually kind of hedge a little bit to kind of, you're going to have small loss for all of these, maybe, but then you have lower loss for that one. So you kind of, you know, pick one that's sort of a little bit away from that. So this is squared loss. I guess this is a cartoon, but whereas absolute loss, well, if you do absolute loss and you move your line up a little bit like this, you've decreased one of these things by say this is you know five away or you know ten away from this ideal point here. This is ten. You've decreased your loss by ten if you or by one if you move this up because you've lowered this thing by one here. Um, but you've increased all of these by, by one too. So that's actually not a good idea to do. What absolute loss will do is actually put a line that goes straight through this um, and just ignores that because you suffer a loss of, of 10 there, um, but it doesn't really matter because you're doing a lot better on everything else. The one dimensional analog of this, if you just have a set of points with, with n just the outputs, there's no inputs even. Uh, if you're trying to minimize L1 loss, or you can just pick kind of a constant value that will minimize L1 loss of the outputs, you'll pick the median of all those points. If you pick a constant point that, uh, that minimizes L2 loss, you'll pick the mean of those points. So this is actually, and in the 2D case it's the same thing, especially if they actually do lie online, but basically this here would be effectively taking, you know, trying to minimize the, the or trying to, to pick the mean the thing that makes these means all similar, sorry, the, 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 the makes, I'll say that differently. If you were to pick, again, sort of one single output here, you'll pick something that, that minimizes or that chooses the mean value. So this sort of lies, if you think of the, the residuals here, you pick kind of the mean residual. Um, whereas in the L1 loss case, or absolute loss case, you will pick the median value. So. Does everyone understand what I mean by that? Let me, let me say that a little bit more formally, because that actually does come up a little bit. Um, when you, especially when you talk about comparing algorithms. So if you have a task, right, where you have some y's, y1 to ym, and you want to minimize, uh, and I'll, let's say I have no inputs, right? My input is nothing. Uh, so xi is just the empty vector or whatever, it's nothing. Um, but my features still might have a constant term. So phi of xi then is going to be equal to 1. If I minimize over theta um, the sum from i equals 1 to m of theta transpose phi of i, but that's just really, you know, that's written out too much there, it's really just theta. I minimize the sum of thetas minus yi, the absolute value. Um, this means that theta star is the median. will be the medium, median of those values. Whereas if I do it with this thing, sum i equals 1 to m theta minus yi squared, that means that theta star is the mean. So this is kind of like, and, and, and basically what you do if you add features is a similar thing. You just first take into account the features, and then whatever's left that you can't predict with the features, you'll either select the theta that gives you the median of that thing, or the mean of that thing. Okay. But this is sort of an important, and actually, this comes really. This becomes very important when we talk about comparing and evaluating algorithms, because if you run an algorithm and say your error is two, you know what does that mean? Um, no, no pun intended, because this is mean here. Uh, wh wh what does it mean to have error equal to two? Is, is that good? I don't really know, right? 
So what you should compare to is either predicting just the mean or predicting the median, depending on which loss function you're using. That's, that, that's a good comparison point. Because if, if, if just predicting the mean of the, of the y's gives you a, you know, a loss of 2.01, then probably you're not doing a whole lot better to, you know, if you add all these features and you get a loss of, uh, or a cost of 2. So we'll, we'll come to that later. Um, all right, so let me say one more thing in the 10 minutes we have left. Um, Oh, actually, before I should say two, so, so there are these differences between absolute loss and, and squared loss and these things. There are real differences. And they, and they make a big difference. The median is not the mean. Um, but it turns out that in this case, uh, this is for our, our prediction task we had, so temperature and, and peak demand, they almost look exactly the same. Right? So this actually happens in a lot of cases, is that you know, it doesn't matter hugely what loss you really pick. This is actually a good thing because, in some sense, what we really care about is probably some other weird loss that we can't really capture that well. For example, it's like how much money do we lose, or how many car how much extra carbon emissions are there if we make a mistake here. That depends on you know if we make a mistake above or below. It's probably a non-convex function. This thing that we're trying you know trying to quantify what what our real cost to the environment is if we make a mistake here. Um, but if we could somehow quantify that exactly, it turns out that using a predictor like this, oftentimes, not always, certainly not always, I mean, these can be as different as you want them to be if you make up examples. But a lot of times, it actually works very well to just use the solution from one of these loss functions. Which is, by the way, I think why least squares is so popular. Uh, we don't often care about squared loss as our ultimate kind of real cost that we have. It's not like you know, squared loss corresponds to money or carbon emissions here. Um, yet, it tends to do a pretty good job if we use that solution. And so least squares is sort of, you know, kind of always the first thing to try if you, you want to try something out like this first. You want to try a simple machine learning algorithm. All right, so let me say one more thing, um, which is just, I'm going to just illustrate here what this looks like in higher dimensions. Because I think people make this mistake a lot. Uh, it's easy to draw graphs in one dimension. So people, when think, people think of higher dimensions, they think of you know, lines in, in higher dimensions. Um, in this case, we have two inputs now. We're going to talk about a slightly different task, where we have the high temperature and the time of day. Remember, way back I talked about, I gave you those curves for you know, the time of day, and it went from like 12 to, to 12, um, so midnight to midnight. And it was like this. you know, with Maybe like that, uh, not quite like, like that or something. Still going down at that point. Um, so you know, it maybe the low at four in the morning, and then the, the peak at five p.m. or so in the day. So um, clearly, the time of day also affects usage, independent of just temperature. I mean, obviously they're correlated, right? Because the higher times of day have higher temperature. Um, but even in the winter, there there was lower usage in the middle of the night. People just don't use electronics and stuff in the middle of the night. So there might be some correlations between both the hour of the day and temperature. Maybe we want to use both of those things to help us predict what the actual demand is going to be. And here we want to talk about peak demand. We want to talk about you know, the demand at that time for that temperature. OK, so now we have two input features. And we have still one output, which is just the in instantaneous demand. And what this looks like now, if you plot this, is this looks like a surface or a bunch of points in three dimensions. Let me see how this works. So I have a nice little animation here. Um, so this is all those points plotted in three dimensions. It's kind of hard to see here. This is why you don't usually see these things in classes, right? It's a little hard to, to visualize these things. But basically, here's temperature here, and it does increase with temperature. And here is hour of the day. And what we'll see when it comes back around is that this thing also increases. Usage also increases as the hour of the day goes up and as temperature goes up, right? And as temperature also goes up also increases. Okay? So we might want to use both those things to help us predict what's really going on. Um, now, this looks a little bit more complicated, maybe, than just the 1D case, or the one-dimensional input case, but it's really not. Um, you do the exact same thing as before. So you form features, and in our case, features, again, are just the exact actual inputs, plus a constant term that lets us basically offset, so we don't have, to have zero being, you know, at the, at the point zero, we don't have to have predicting zero, we're not predicting zero demand. Um, and everything is exactly the same as before. The matrices are formed the same. In fact, because when, when I went through all this, uh, I wasn't talking about sizes of anything. right? I was just talking about vectors of arbitrary size. And so actually, the solution we derived was a solution for general size inputs. Okay? 
So it's exactly the same. It might look more complicated. Uh, after three dimensions, or after two dimensions, it's very, very hard to plot these things, by the way. Um, basically not doable, you can't visualize it. But it doesn't matter how many dimensions you have, you can have 50 inputs. You form the same matrices as before, output same as before, and your solution is the same. Here the solution is a vector in R3 because we have uh, a weight on those first two terms and then the last weight is uh, a, the parameter that goes with the constant term, which is kind of like the intercept, right? What this looks like then in the actual data is a plane fit to this data. So we take all these points. For each point here, we compute basically theta 1 times this one, or whichever one, theta 1 times this plus theta 2 times the other one. We add theta 3, and that's our prediction. And so predictions in two dimensions, with two-dimensional inputs, look like a plane. Not a line, but a plane to the data. Similarly, in higher dimensions, they are a hyperplane. So they are essentially, for every input, right, you have some predicted output. And, and the way to visualize that is that you have your input space on, you know, the, I guess here on these two dimensions. For every value of input, you have some predicted output, and so that just corresponds to some point in, in 3D space there. Okay? So that's a very brief statement there. It's just that some people sort of, and, and I'll show this, this will become a lot more interesting when we talk about nonlinear regression, nonlinear regression. Um, but I want to sort, <coughs> sort of emphasize the high dimensional potentially characteristic of these things because they're applicable well beyond just a single dimension. Uh, and so it's important to know that these can be, these, these, these not that they can be applied, they, they are being applied here really to, to higher dimensional inputs. Um, it's just easier sometimes to graph one input and one output. Uh, but I'll do this a little bit too. It's just, as you can see, it's a little bit dizzying to, to look at this too much. Um, also, MATLAB is not very good at, at back face calling, I guess. So it sort of moves around which points behind what and everything like that. So you get kind of funky looking graphics as well too sometimes. So, okay, so we'll finish that up with today because we're almost done anyway. But next time we'll talk about the nonlinear versions of all of this. So fitting nonlinear functions to data. And what's nice is that we're actually going to use a framework that is virtually identical. Because we're not going to capture actually nonlinear kind of functions in the parameters. We're just going to use nonlinear functions of the data itself. And we can capture very, very um, rich and expressive functions still using the framework of linear regression here. So we'll cover that next time. Okay?